All right, now I think we're on. I had to try two different microphones today. This has been challenging. I, uh, I want to thank you for your very interesting answers that you came up with the dirtiest animals, kids. I noticed the warthog, the skunk, the rat worm, the rat worm, I, didn't even, I have to look what that is, a dung beetle, a rat, someone said the human. I, uh, I, I, nobody got what my wife told me. I don't know if you can see this from, from here, but this is a cockroach. Chris, who's on sound today, and I were in Bangladesh, and I found one of these in the stores. It's a clay cockroach. This has been the bane of my household. I'm very lucky my wife didn't throw it out because I hide it on her. And uh, you know, in Asia, where we lived, the cockroaches can really get in and, and scare you, and they fly too, so they're, they're dirty. But a number of you picked out what I thought you would pick out, which was, yes, the pig. The pig is, is mentioned. I have a, 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 a pig. This was the uh, special family heirloom that goes around in our family. At Thanksgiving time, the person who eats the most gets awarded the Pig of the Year award. Uh, and so here it is. And uh, I'll tell you an interesting story because when we lived in, in India, we were a part of a small but very diverse church. And uh, a number of uh, people were in the church from different parts of the world and different parts of India. And uh, a lot of uh, Indians are vegetarians, but we also had uh, one of the leaders in our church came from a tribe that had formerly been a, a head-hunting tribe in northeast India, and they were known to eat anything that moves. And he was hosting our Wednesday night, a Bible study, and he cooks up an amazing pork dinner. And then he has the audacity to ask the vegetarian in our church, brother, would you please bless the food for us? And I, and I kid you not, the, the brother starts his prayer like this, Lord, my brother has asked me to bless what you have cursed. <laughs> and so, you know, I thought he was, was joking, but he was very much in earnest. He was very serious. And uh, it's very much a live issue today in some parts of the world, uh, food and diet and, and, these, and these kinds of issues. Well, one thing that might surprise us you know, we have them as pets, you know, and it's the dog, these cute little dogs that we have, you know, in our homes, and they seem so cute and, and cuddly and not so dirty to us, right? But in uh, Jewish culture and also in many parts of the world, dogs are not a clean animal. We're thinking about street dogs, not pets here. And so we need to be aware that uh, in the Old Testament, you know, dogs are not first and foremost considered man's best friend, but the carriers of disease. They were considered unclean. And most of us being Gentiles, this is something hard for us to grasp, but Gentiles were also placed in the unclean category. So in Matthew 15, a Gentile woman, a Canaanite, comes and kneels before Jesus, asking him to help her demon-possessed daughter. And in response, Jesus says, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, this reflected the Jewish attitude toward non-Jews. Dogs were dirty animals, and non-Jews or Gentiles were also considered unclean. Jesus was testing his disciples as well as the woman to see what they would do. Now, the woman shows this remarkable faith, and her daughter is healed. Well, in John, six, John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus makes it clear that his plan of salvation does, in fact, include Gentiles. And here he no longer calls them dogs. This time he calls them sheep. He says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Well, today's passage in Acts 11 is a fulfillment of Jesus' words in John 10. It shows how God is including other sheep, the Gentiles, in his plan of salvation. 
And further, it shows a fulfillment of Jesus' words that there will be only one flock and one shepherd. There are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. Those of us Gentiles who believe in Jesus are no longer dogs. We have been made clean and follow the same good shepherd as the Jews who believed in Jesus the Messiah. If you are able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's holy word. We'll be reading from Acts 11, 1 through 18. As we turn to God's holy word, let's pray first and ask his blessing. Oh Lord, would you strengthen these feeble knees? Would you use these feeble thoughts to glorify your name this morning? Would you challenge us to see your glory that is extending to the dirtiest, to the unclean, to those who were formerly lost and defiled, but whom in the Lord Jesus Christ you are restoring and cleansing and making a people who are your very own, holy, beloved. We pray this for the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated. It's interesting that our chapter opens with a report saying that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Notice it doesn't say that an army commander, a Roman centurion, and his family received the word of God. What makes the headlines in the region of Judea is the shocking news that the Gentiles were hearing about Jesus' resurrection. And for those who are used to thinking about Gentiles as dogs, this was truly astonishing. And it doesn't go without criticism. We hear that the circumcision party is offended. Well, circumcision and diet were what separated Jews from Gentiles by all outward appearances and why Gentiles, like dogs, were considered unclean. The circumcision party were Jews who believed in Jesus but who assumed people had to be circumcised and abide by the food restrictions of the Mosaic Law. Up to this point in the book of Acts, the gospel had crossed over to the Samaritans, those half-breeds who were not fully Jewish, 
and to proselytes. The proselytes were Gentile converts to Judaism who had been circumcised and who kept the Mosaic law. But this is the first time a full-blown Gentile household believed. The circumcision party became a very powerful block among the early Christians. Apparently, Jesus' brother James was in with them. And we learn in Galatians 2.12 that Peter himself is later led astray by them and that Paul had to confront Peter on this. It says in Galatians 2.12, For before certain men came, came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he, Peter, drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. I think it's very hard for us to imagine what the barrier was like. I have spent some years living across the tracks, both in the U.S. and in India. For a couple of years after college, I lived in a predominantly African-American neighborhood in a suburb of Chicago. And when Ginny and I lived in India, we moved into the neighborhood of an indigenous ethnic group who were basically considered to be unsafe by the dominant ethnic group who had invited us. But neither of these experiences, I think, quite capture the shock of what the circumcision party had to come to grips with. I think a closer idea of how shocking it would be to hear uh, that Peter had eaten with Gentiles is if you imagine one of our elders, let's say Rob Gregory, I didn't ask your permission, Rob, had gone into a doghouse, eaten dog food, and tried to share the glories of God, of the gospel, with a pit bull. How does that sound to you? A little bit ridiculous, right? Well, we have dogs as pets, and yet it seems a little bit unclean, doesn't it? I think we begin to get an idea of how offensive it was to hear that a Jewish apostle had eaten with uncircumcised men. Well, it's also helpful to understand the biblical concept of how a meal is tied into fellowship. Throughout the Bible, and I think still today, eating with someone is a sign of deep fellowship, of connection, of relationship. Remember, Abraham welcomed the three visitors, and he served them a meal. After Moses received the Ten Commandments, he, Aaron, Aaron's sons, and the 70 elders actually ate a fellowship meal with God. Jesus ate fish with the disciples after his resurrections on at least two occasions. In Acts 1-4, it mentions that Jesus was eating with the apostles when he told them about the coming gift of the Holy Spirit. And very significantly, Paul told, told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5.11 not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. In other words, eating was a sign of fellowship, and not eating was a sign of separation. The bottom line is this. In Peter's decision to eat with the Gentiles, he was acknowledging them to be clean and worthy of fellowship. They were no longer dogs. Well, we need to begin to apply this in our own lives. You and I are not likely to have a vision of a sheet being lowered from heaven. Peter explains in verse 5 that the sheet comes right up to him. It came down to me, he says. He was forced to interact with it. Personal involvement was required. Well, you are not likely to see a vision of a sheet but very likely something you find disgusting may come right up to you. It may be that God will call you into an uncomfortable situation. And you need to be able to discern whether it is something God has called clean. In other words, God may take you and me out of our comfort zones and put us in a circumstance in which we need to share the gospel with someone who looks or sounds very different than us. What must we do? Well, the main thrust of the heavenly command comes in verse 12. It says, 
the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. Making no distinction is the key. It is so significant that Peter later repeats this phrase verbatim at the first ecumenical church council. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, he's talking about the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Making no distinction means Peter had to go without misgivings, without hesitation, and without criticism. It's actually the same Greek verb verb that's used up in verse 2 in regard to the circumcision party's attitude toward Peter, where it is translated criticized. Here, Peter was told by the Spirit not to criticize. It's a word from the Spirit that I sometimes need to hear. It's easy for me to criticize others, to make distinctions, to stay in my own comfortable cliques. And I wonder if it's a word that Cornerstone needs to hear, too. Are you and I failing to take the word of God to others because we are making distinctions? Does your criticism of certain groups lead you to disobey the Spirit? Paul was very careful to say that church leaders must at times judge those within the church, but never outsiders, never the unchurched. For what have I to do with judging outsiders, he wrote. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught, Judge not that you be not judged. On Judgment Day, God forbid that some people say they never heard the gospel because Dave Phillips never shared it with them. If you have neighbors who don't claim to be Christians, who haven't experienced the love of God in Jesus Christ, then you must be very careful not to make distinctions, not to assume that they are not interested in the gospel or that they won't respond to it. If Peter had made distinctions, Cornelius and his household would not have received the good news of forgiveness of sins through Jesus' name. We also need to notice in this passage the way that God works through natural connections of friends and relatives. We get some information here in chapter 11 that wasn't in chapter 10. Specifically in verse 14, we read that Cornelius was told that he and all his household would be saved. What an amazing promise. No wonder Cornelius had invited his relatives and close friends. Some of you have been surprised that we baptize whole families here at Cornerstone. But it is the biblical pattern. Just as baby boys of Jewish believers were circumcised in the Old Testament, children of believers are baptized in the New Testament. Baptism is a more inclusive sign than circumcision, since circumcision was limited to males. Baptism includes women and girls in addition to men and boys. This is the second of five household baptisms mentioned in the book of Acts, the first being at Pentecost, where children are specifically mentioned. In all five household baptisms recorded in Acts, there is no hint that any children of believers were excluded. In any case, I don't think anyone will disagree that the example before us suggests that we need to invite all our relatives and close friends to hear the gospel. We can pray that the Spirit comes on all who hear the message, just as the Spirit did that day on Cornelius' whole household. And as our relatives hear the word of God, we should have no hesitation to have our whole household baptized, just like Cornelius, Lydia, the Philippian jailer, and Crispus, the Corinthian synagogue ruler, did. If you see that God is in the business of saving whole households and want to talk more about having your children baptized, please talk to Pastor Billy or me about it. Now, just to clarify, in case you think that I'm saying that faith or belief is not necessary for someone to be saved, that's not what I'm saying. Parents must have faith, at least one parent, and we pray that infants and children will come to a point of faith in Jesus as well. Now, there's another somewhat controversial topic that is addressed in this passage, 
And that's the idea of a second blessing of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came on the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, he came at a different time than when they first believed. And some have used this to argue for a second blessing of the Holy Spirit that happens at a later time when one believes. Well, Pastor Billy has already addressed the fact that this was necessary in that case, in the case of the Samaritans, in order to prevent the church being permanently divided between Israelite and Samaritan. Well, notice in this case that the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles at the same time that they received the gospel. But notice in verse 17 that in Peter's explanation of Pentecost, he likewise records the time that the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles themselves being at the same time as they believed. Peter says that God gave them the Holy Spirit when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. After they believed, like Thomas, that Jesus was God, that he was alive forevermore and would return to be the judge of the whole earth, they received the Holy Spirit. And technically, there were some days or weeks between Thomas's confession and Pentecost, but Peter compressed these events and theologically joins them together. The point is that you get the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus. You get the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus. It's unwise and even dangerous to pit the Holy Spirit against Jesus when they are two persons of the same trinity. The Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the Spirit of Jesus. And Jesus himself said that the Holy Spirit would glorify him. You see, the Holy Spirit is always going to point you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit's always going to point you to Jesus. And any spirit that is not glorifying Jesus is a false spirit. All you must do to receive the Holy Spirit is to believe in Jesus, that he is the Lord, the eternal God of the universe, to whom all praise and glory is due, and that he is the Christ, that is the anointed Israelite prophet, priest, and king, to whom all service and loyalty is due. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you too will receive the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is the helper or the advocate who teaches us all things, who sets our minds on life and peace, who helps us submit to God's moral law as something delightful, who helps us put to death the misdeeds of the body, who bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God who helps us in our weakness and who is interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. When you get Jesus, you get the Father and the Spirit thrown into one God, eternally existing in three persons, equal in power and glory. And related to this, You don't have to speak in tongues in order to know you have received the Holy Spirit. Some churches teach that the gift of the Holy Spirit must be accompanied by speaking in tongues. Well, first of all, there is no hint in the book of Acts that tongues were some kind of angelic language unknown to humans. The miracle at Pentecost was that the apostles could speak in Persian, Arabic, and other languages without having studied them. It makes me believe, and I'm not alone in this idea, that Cornelius or some members of his household began speaking in Aramaic or Hebrew, even though he, as a Roman soldier, probably only had studied Latin or Greek and Greek. In any case, Scripture makes it very clear that what Cornelius and his household were saying in tongues was understood because we know that they were extolling God, Acts 10, 46. Now about the closest modern story I have heard where God worked miraculously uh, in the case uh, is a friend of ours who we knew from India. She was raised in a Hindu family. Uh, By the way, I got her permission to share this story. And uh, she had never read any of the Bible or been exposed to hardly anything at all Christian Christian. 
And one day she decided to visit a church. And she came home and she was very excited because she had heard something she had never heard before. And she began telling her family about what she had heard and that she had been to a church. Well, unfortunately for her, she was not, did not receive the reception she was expecting. Her family was immediately very critical of it. They persecuted her severely. And while she was undergoing a severe physical uh, persecution from her family, she began to say things that she had never read before in the Bible in her mother tongue. And she, she told them, there is no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus. She also told them, the idols that we are worshiping, Hindus have idols in their ha- household, the idols that you are worshiping are false gods. And these things, she had never read the Bible. And yet she was, she was able to proclaim in a, in a language that was understood. Um, but even if we understand tongues correctly as speaking a known language that was not learned from childhood or studied, we need to ask whether this gift was the norm or whether it was a unique sign with some special significance. Now, without even trying to address when tongues cease, by looking at the three or possibly four times tongues were exhibited in the book of Acts, we can observe that all of the instances happened when the gospel was breaking some kind of ethnic or cultural barrier. So the first time was in Acts 2, the Pentecost, and it says the gospel was being proclaimed to God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Second time that it may have happened was when the Holy Spirit came upon the Samaritans in chapter 8. It doesn't specifically mention tongues in that case, but because the way the Spirit was manifested proved impressive to Simon the magician, it suggests there was some outward sign that happened when the Holy Spirit came on them. The third time we read about tongues is here with Cornelius' family, the non-Jews. And finally, in Acts 19.6, we find the uh, gift of tongues being mentioned when the gospel crossed from the Middle East into Europe, specifically the city of Corinth. So in the book of Acts, it certainly is not normal for tongues to occur every time the gospel is shared. As Pastor Billy has mentioned on several occasions, there was certainly something unique about the apostles and that time period. And one of the reasons why God used the Jewish apostles during these cross-cultural miraculous outpourings of the Holy Spirit was so that there would be one church united across the Jewish-Gentile barrier across the language barriers, and across the continental or geographic barriers. One flock and one shepherd. And this leads us to our final point. Peter concludes his remarks to the circumcision party with a question. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? that I could stand in God's way. Sadly, many churches have united around language, around ethnicity, or around nationalistic causes rather than around the resurrection of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins he offers us by his death on the tree. What should still amaze us is that there is no language, no ethnicity, no disgusting animal eating people, and no nation that will be excluded by Jesus and his kingdom. As the Apostle John saw in his glorious revelation on the island of Patmos, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It was a very sad day for me when the flags of many nations of the world were quietly removed 
from our worship space. But regardless of symbols, I challenge us as Cornerstone Presbyterian Church to take the gospel across barriers such as race, language, and class. Do you and I believe that the Holy Spirit of Jesus was intended to be poured out upon those who sound and look different than us? We should be amazed, first of all, that the gospel came to us, many of us bacon-loving Gentiles. We are no longer dogs, but sheep. Well, how should you and I respond when God gives his salvation to those who look and sound different than us? Well, we see two appropriate responses in the last verse of our text today, verse 18. First of all, we should be silent. We should stop criticizing people who have different diets, who wear different clothing or jewelry, who have hairstyles that shock us, who drive vehicles that we don't like, who root for the wrong football team, or who vote for politicians that we can't stand. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit just might possibly fall on these people? If you hear that they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then fall silent. And secondly, notice that the former critics now glorified God. Don't be like the second son in the parable who wouldn't join the party for his prodigal brother that returned. Glorify God that he delights to rescue the lost and cleanse the defiled, that he turns dogs into sheep so there will be one flock led by one good shepherd. Before you and I believed, every one of us was defiled. The issue at hand is Jesus' mission to seek and save the lost. Do not stand in his way. Amen. Ask the praise team to come up now. We'll have a closing song to respond.